Hello, and welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 78. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Dave, salute from the New York Stock Exchange floor with the back shot on the balcony. We do our stand-ups and remotes from this angle. Uh, our set's right down this corner, as you know. You were here last week. Great to see you. Good. Yep. We just had some time at IBM event. Yes, so. long time no see, John. <laughs> <laughs> John and Dave back together again at the IBM event, uh, the Analyst Forum. And again, I'm here at the Stock Exchange. I got uh, some interviews lining up and uh, some major action going on here. Um, next week, um, it's going to be heavy. So I'm staying for the weekend in New York. See my daughter Jacqueline. She lives in town, and weather should be good. So it should be great. You know, it's be good. Could be in New York. And next week, Dave, yeah. we got Arca Arcus is doing a Monday happy hour presentation and meetup. So Monday night up at the 1792 restaurant, all the top, you know, uh, ecosystem from that company. And then um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is the highly anticipated East Coast version of AI leaders. We did one, remember, in Silicon Valley. Um, there's a welcome reception Tuesday night, and then that has 75 VIPs booked. So the welcome reception is 75 people. And, of course, the Cube Digital Twin program of AI leaders has got three and a half days of packed coverage. Salonis, top startups, really high-end people from AI uh, companies, AI infrastructure, we got telecom space, and then private equity week on Thursday. So it's going to be just a wall-to-wall -wall content program, um, packed expert tech coverage. And then on Thursday, RC AI is doing a lunch presentation. So what's going on is the network is just rapidly expanding, Dave, here in New York. And it's kind of like a real-time formation of people meeting here with NYSE Wired, with Brian Bauman, who's got such an agility model with the facility here. We bolt on the digital twin programming, which is the digital version of the meetup. And what's happening is that people are telling their friends and they're all coming in. So the, it's a, the leaders are coming in to one, share and, and kind of mingle and collaborate with each other. It's an open ecosystem day. It's developing in real time. It's not like some social network you join. It's on topics of people coming together and it's just growing, right? So it's really strong because people can meet their peers. And you love this because, you know, Wikibon, your original uh, Cube Research was Wikibon was, uh, you know, be a free content. The free content drives it. The facility here drives it. The you know, stuff exchange is phenomenal for that. And of course, CNBC and uh, we just got the media badge here. So the Cube is up and running. We're part of the, the machine. Yeah, so check it out. So that's, check it out. So, so you I love it. So I saw, yeah, I saw your text this morning. <laughs> so you, uh, just to connect the dots, so we ran a program, you and I ran a program uh, a month or so ago out in Palo Alto, you know, AI innovators. You did a, a, a program uh, a few weeks ago yeah. out of the NYSE. I did one last week, which we're going to be publishing on Tuesday. It was the CXO series, Sunny Singh who runs Oracle's uh, banking and financial business was the headliner. He was ringing the bell. And so we're going to drop that the CXOs next Tuesday, chief investment officers, chief information officers, chief information security officers, chief strategy officers, CEOs. Amazing. Yep. A, a lot of the alternative clouds were there uh, like Lambda and Crusoe. And so, and, and we had Cloudflare CISO on so many we had uh, CFOs on, uh, Cribble CF, CFO. So that's dropping next Tuesday. Now you're going to do this next week. Uh, we'll probably drop it the following week. And then, of course, I'm at UiPath next week. And we're also doing okay. Salonis. So you're having, you're having Alex on, I think, today, pre-recorded. And yeah. then they're, they're awesome. Love what they're doing. Love what UiPath yeah. is doing with agents. So it's all coming together. Like you said, the network affects. It's Metcalf's law. It's the <laughs> Well, I, it's awesome here, and what's really good about um, NYSC, they love the, they love to have Cube here. We do a lot of content, deep dives. I don't know if you noticed, but when we started, the Silicon Angle logo was on the big board behind us. They could they can put logos up there. That was a gesture of uh, a jet, positive gesture to us, kind of a hat tip, if you will, uh, to kick off our podcast. So thanks to NYSC. Now it's Korea because the large the governor of Korea is here. Uh, and so basically the president of Korea, because it's the largest providence uh, in Korea. Um, they're downstairs. They were here for the opening bell. They're here for a presentation. I think they're going to actually do the closing bell, too. I, I got to get the specifics. Um, but all, an entourage of all the, the heavyweights, uh, the big big wigs uh, from Korea are here. 
And again, this is what makes the NYSE so unique. There's always something going on. There's always leaders coming in here. There's keynote talks. They're having events. Um, so maybe we can see the Cube logo come back, SiliconANGLE logo come back. But I'm sure someone said, get that Cube logo, get that SiliconANGLE logo off and put up that Korea logo. We've got the big president of Korea here. <laughs> so I think there's more of an interstitial opportunity for, the, for us. So all fun. Uh, but you know, I could I could talk forever on how exciting it is to be here because of the access, and the reason why this uh, uh, this event this week is is important, um, just like your event you did last week. But this one is the New York version of our Silicon Valley AI infrastructure leaders we did two months ago. Now, why it's important, Dave, and the folks watching, as you know, is that we're creating regional content in New York and Silicon Valley because there's networks in here and there geographically, physically located in those regions. And our part of our CUBE region expansion is to go where there's a concentration of entrepreneurs and leaders, experts, and get them into the CUBE network, but also it's digital. So there's a, there's a, a backbone. So people in New York are flying to California. Sometimes they don't want to fly. They can connect with people and just ping people on, on digital, whether it's LinkedIn or text or WhatsApp or Telegram, whatever the method, once they meet face-to-face, -face, the digital twin carried the load, and that network effect is now real, and it's ad hoc, but it grows around real-time activities. And then, so we get critical mass, and it's growing. So this New York event is really special because now we're going to have the East Coast leaders here, uh, and that connects the Silicon Valley group. So now you have a connection between two worlds. Digital creates a seamless connection, and what's going to come out of it is more content for the cube, more access for the right uh, co companies that need visibility. Because there's so many startups that are like sitting out there, they can't get any visibility because there's not enough media covering it. All they want to do is cover Facebook and and Nvidia. Although Nvidia's you know market cap is three trillion, I'm kind of not long term on Nvidia. I'm kind of down on one Nvidia long term. But but my point is is that the startups, there's so many startups, and they're all like players. They're either sold the company before, Dave, or they have another company they're doing now. And I won't say playing with house money because that's more of a gambling term, but what they're doing is they're actually coming back for another fight at the apple, so to speak, you know, pun intended. So this is really important because they have the experience because the speed of the AI game is so fast. You're starting to see experienced entrepreneurs and they're mentoring the first time entrepreneurs, the young guns coming out of school. So it's quite a grow or growing, organic, vibrant, developer community, entrepreneurial community, startup community, it's super hot and, and it's, it's really special. I haven't seen this kind of action since the dot-com bubble days and the web 2.0 early days, but it's different because we have digital. Everyone's connected. You don't have to go meet someone at a meetup. You meet them once, you get to the crew, you get to the crowd, you connect, take it from there. So, well, super, super exciting. Plus because the capital markets in New York are you know, number one in the world, Everybody goes to New York, right? I mean, it doesn't matter where they are. They could be, you know, based in Europe. They could be based in AP. You had Korea in there today. They could be based in Silicon Valley. Everybody comes to New York. So we've got both coasts covered. And of course, we have our satellite, you know, outside of Boston as well. It's more of a destination where we are here. But still, we pump a lot of content out, John. All right, you want to get to the news? A lot going on this yeah. week. Eh? Well, let's get, there's a ton of news. I think the big thing I want to talk to you about is that we just, you just drove back last night from New York. I'm still here. IBM had a two-day analyst, it's kind of an analyst annual forum. They call it the uh, AD, uh, IBM uh, Analyst Forum, but it's basically all the analysts and the industry analysts. So uh, CEO came on, Arvind Krishna, all the top executives, Rob, Rob uh, and, and Dario were there, Dario Gill and Rob Thomas, and, and all the top executives in their new building at One Madison. And IBM really lifted the curtain, Dave. You had a post up, we, you and I published basically last night, um, yep. Got it out fast, like we always do. But uh, I learned a lot. I want to get your take because you and I were riffing. We didn't have time to kind of debrief uh, on that. You know, obviously Bruno Aziza now is there. Ritika's there. You got Google Cloud folks there. IBM's got a great talent bench, and so and they got Mojo, Dave. So it's Ajay it's Patel. Like old... Ajay Patel is there. Um, yes. So yeah. Right. I mean, uh, I mean, but... Arvin's basically saying I would I would do more acquisitions if I had didn't have regulators on my back. So, you know, I, he's he's itching. You can see in his eyes, he's got a new culture change. He's, they, they're betting on open ecosystem, the streamlining the product portfolio. 
what's your take, Dave? I mean, what's, what's your assessment as you first give me your your walk away vibe of IBM, and then go into some specifics uh, on IBM. I mean, I mean, first of all, under Arvind Krishna's leadership, IBM has just way more focus. Uh, you know, they, the acquisition of Red Hat is clearly working out, even though there are a lot of skeptics, the $34 billion move. But that has enabled IBM to execute on a hybrid cloud strategy, and it's given them access to OpenShift, you know, the leading container platform. They've grown that business. They said he said they grew it from, I want to say, 150 million to now it's well over a billion, headed toward 2 billion. So it's a 10x revenue business for them. Um, the much more focused uh, organization around AI, sort of Watson 2.0 or Watson X, is you know much less aspirational. Maybe I shouldn't say less aspirational, but it's much more focused. It's not trying to be everything to everybody. And of course, he mentioned that with Watson 1.0, they tried to automate everything, and he said that type of you know strategy didn't work. So now we're really out targeting real problems. The other thing that strikes me is they've done, and this is not front and center, but it's obvious to me that they're doing a much, much better job between Dario Gill, who runs IBM Research, and Rob Thomas, who runs the go-to-market and the software business, that they're doing a much better job of taking innovation out of the labs and bringing that to market, something that IBM was dismal at uh, under previous administrations, particularly under Ginny. They just they didn't really do a good job connecting that. They just sort of relied on their services to lead. And now they got a consulting organization under Muhammad Ali that's basically yep. injecting software into the organization that's going to drive operating leverage. So I really like that piece of the strategy. And that's a big part of the reason why, you know, IBM's stock, and oh, by the way, they've done some really good uh, tuck-in acquisitions beyond Red Hat, you know, things like Aptio and Turbonomic. And so they're getting their IT ops act together, which is a, a wheelhouse for IBM. All of that is Aptio. added up to- I wouldn't, call, I wouldn't call Aptio a tuck-in. That was pretty significant dumb money. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it wasn't, yeah, but the reason it's called, I call it a tuck-in is because it wasn't really, it wasn't hard to get through regulators. Like Arvin said, yeah. if if yeah. if if they tried to do something in mainframe, because they have a monopoly there almost, they wouldn't get in there. But let me just say, their stock is at, almost at, an, at, at or near an all-time high. Their, their valuation is now up over $200 billion again. And I, I, you know, IBM's back. I wrote a I wrote a post on LinkedIn, you know, several I don't know a year ago, or saying I've never, you know, nine months ago, I've never been I haven't been this excited about IBM in a long, long time, and I'm happy that the the stock has performed subsequent to that post because yeah. uh, it's always good to be right. And, and I think you know the vibe was we got our mojo back, and Arvind Krishna is you know going for it. The um... Holger Muller asked him a question about what the growth percentages were, just to your point about OpenShift. 10X since the acquisition on growth. Ansible is doing extremely well as, as expected. Watson X is doing good, but it's a low base. Um, in terms of revenue, it's still small, but I mean, but percentage wise, it's up. Aptio and Turbonomic. Um, these acquisitions, tuck ins that you mentioned, are actually pretty part of the puzzle pieces. And we'll get to that in a second. I want to discuss that with you, but also System Z, Z, with mainframe, is also doing well. Um, he kind of made a comment on his, oh, it's, it's printing money. He didn't say printing money. He had a comment about that. I can't remember what he said, but he said, it's kicking ass, um, or Arvind said. So, you know, it's clear that they've got the puzzle pieces. And Arvind is a, is a, he's a techie, right? He understands operating systems. He understands what he's trying to do. He's trying to get the puzzle pieces. And he said, if you remember um, in that briefing to us, that he wants to assemble um, all the right pieces. He and his aspiration is to close the loop. But he says there's still a couple pieces I still want to get. He's referring to Ansible and then up the stack with the data layer. So clearly he sees some things that aren't yet plugged into the puzzle. But his puzzle is very good: productivity and cost management. And if you look at like Aptio and Turbonomic and Coop Cost, which they bought recently. The number one conversation around AI is what's the productivity gains? That's more of a human capital labor issue. What's the relationship to the human? And give me a multiplier with operating leverage, as you mentioned, that the consulting team's doing. What's that doing? That's easy to measure. And then what's the cost of things like compute? What's the cost of running things? So I think that's super smart to get those puzzle pieces first. And then if you look at um, uh, the other things that are going on, like you can see the quantum piece is now popping its head up. You can see where Dario, who used to run Quantum, and so this is his pet project, he, he he won't stop talking about Quantum if you bring it up, because he loves it. But the compute 
era is here again. So computing, quote, whether you call it accelerated computing, is a big part of it. So cost management will be huge. And I think it's smart for IBM to focus on this right now because the evolution of AI is just going to be a progression of how fast people adopt it or the population of users using enterprise AI, which is only about 1% according to their data. So yeah, I think IBM is pragmatic in its approach. Um, I still think they got some things to clean up from the perception standpoint. It was brought up, but I think just tactically from what I hear, their sales teams, their go-to-market, they just got to get better at those things. And that's what Irvin said, they could have done more growth, um, but that's on them. That's why he admit that. I think you asked the question on that one. Oh, yeah, so I, I did. Think I, like, I like what they're doing. To me, that's one of the most interesting things here. But but before we, before I go there, he gave us some <clears throat> indications of what IBM are doing internally with AI. I like when big companies like IBM, Dell actually does a pretty good job of this as well. I've had some stuff with Dell on uh, their AI next best action, which is really interesting. And some of the cost savings that they've been uh, affecting. When you're a hundred billion dollar company or in you know, IBM's case, yeah. you know, approaching a hundred billion, you can, you can take a lot of cost out. He said that IBM has realized $1.6 billion in cost efficiencies to date with approximately half of that <clears throat> attributed to AI deployment. This is around automation, this is this year. And he said that he aims to achieve 3 billion in efficiencies in 2025. And he's saying, he also said that 75% of their service queries <clears throat> to IBM are now addressed through AI powered self-service platforms. And that's been a culmination of what he's called a five-year journey. So that was pretty, pretty interesting. And the other thing is we on day one, we heard from Muhammad Ali, who heads IBM's consulting business. He's a senior vice president, former IDG CEO. He and I never crossed paths when I was at IDG. But nonetheless, to me, the most interesting takeaway that uh, I left with in his session was they are injecting software into their consulting business. And are we I asked Arvin, I, I actually asked somebody in the hallway. Has, have you guys ever given guidance on consulting margins and what the impact is going to be of all this yeah. software and platform? And, and I was told by the individual, probably because they just didn't know, no, we've never given guidance. And so when I asked the question, I said, I know you haven't given guidance. He said, actually, I have given guidance. And what he said when in answer to my question of how consulting economics will change and what we can we expect in terms of the, the margin guidance, he said, right now we're in the low teens. Now, I think he's talking about operating margin because their gross margin is higher than that. So it's got to be operating margin. And I searched around a little bit and I haven't seen any public statements on operating margin for consulting specifically. But what he said is it's in the low teens and we'll get that up into the mid to high teens. So you're talking about a substantial increase. There's a $20 billion business. And if you're talking about a four or five point increase over the next couple of years in operating margins, that's going to drop, you know, right to EBIT, and it's going to drop, you know, right to profit. It's yep. going to throw off free cash flow. So that, to me, was one of the most exciting sort of financial takeaways that yep. I heard. And then the, the other thing I want to talk about and get your opinion on is it's we we can't talk about it too much because it's 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 NDA, but it's very <laughs> clear if you look at IBM's uh, strategy and Scott Hebner and George Gilbert and I wrote about this that. The strategy that IBM should take is not so much worrying about you know large language models and competing with OpenAI and competing with Llama. They're they're gonna you know use those where appropriate. IBM's got this new open ecosystem posture. But what IBM should be doing is focusing on what you just referred to is that one percent of data that's not that 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 is is hidden. That ninety nine percent of data that's hidden. That that these big LLMs these multi hundred billion dollar or hundred billion parameter models are training on the internet, go at rather go after the 99% of data that's proprietary, that's on-prem, that's that's hidden, or maybe it's in the cloud and, and, and go after smaller language models, applying those for domain specific use cases where the customer can get proprietary advantage. What we talk about is the cube uh, power law uh, the Cube Research Power Law, the, the Gen AI Power Law, that domain specificity around smaller language models. And that's very clearly what we heard from, you know, Dario Gill and Rob Thomas and, and others, that that's really where IBM hopes to differentiate. So I'm kind of excited about that. I would say this, I'll, I'll share this with you. And this is kind of the hallway talk as well. IBM's got some announcements coming that again, we can't talk about, but if this were a, startup making the announcements that IBM is going to make, 
um, it would be headline news. It would be driving yeah. massive, massive uh, uh, investments from VCs and, and valuations. Massive. Yeah. I mean, the stuff that they're doing is incredible. The benchmarks were incredible. We'll see that when the news comes out. We really can't spill the beans. We're under an NDA, as you mentioned. Um, I, I want to just comment about your, your question of, to Mohammed Ali, who runs consulting, and then the follow-up question to Arvind, the CEO, which was a great question, by the way. I thought that was really on point. Um, and we talked about either last pod or the podcast before. We Remember we talked about how the modern companies in AI are doing two things right now that's unique we've never seen before. They're writing to the kernel level from a coding perspective to get performance. And two, they're using professional services with a flywheel operating uh, leverage platform. So platform and services together because we're in the services business now. Everything's a service. You know, software is a service, AI is a service. So the word service is moving. Now, professional services like the Essentials of the World and um, uh, AW, uh, IBM Consulting, that scales with people. It doesn't scale exponentially like platforms. So what's happening is the right to the kernel, that's the developer piece, but the platform in a service, professional services model completely changes the game. And I equate this to what was coined about a decade ago. Remember that 10X engineer, I think Andreessen Horowitz quoted that. 10X mm -hmm. engineer means use the cloud and you're going to get 10X the value with one engineer. You don't need to hire 100. You should hire 10. That's 10X. You hire one, that's 10. So that was implying that you get a multiplier of leverage, technical labor benefit with the cloud. Well, okay, really now we're in an era where so business like productivity is coming in on a 10 plus X multiplier. So the 10 X consultant is coming. And I think if you look at the persistence, the Deloitte's, the Accenture's, if they're not implementing this, what IBM's doing, they will be out of business because they get, that, that's gonna kill margins, which you brought up. And it also, it goes faster. So if you look at Muhammad's presentation at, at IBM, that was it. Now, how does this all tie together? IBM stands for International Business Machines. That's the original name from when it was founded by Tom Watson back in the day. You're a historian. We know the history. I used to work there uh, and in college and right out of college. And what they did was they, they made computing and they brought it to companies. And then they would do all the service. They'd do the punch cards and put everything in there, the tape, all the old school stuff. And this is why the services thing should not be laughed at. Oh, IBM's a services company. Because one, it's going to have higher margin and do faster things for customers. But that's what they've always done. Now, where the technology product let growth comes in is where Watson X is. And this is where I think it's going to be incredible because if you look at what they're doing there, they're simplifying the portfolio. But Arvin said in our presentation or his keynote or Q&A with us, ask me anything in session, he said the culture at IBM has changed since he's got there. They don't, they're not going to compete. They're going to bet on open ecosystems because they're better at partnering like they've always done from their roots and integrating. And he is so right on that. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to have to be in a, always a services business, professional services. They can be the old IBM. Bring computing, which is now the number one thing people want, GPUs and lower cost power computing, with the AI software. Hey, software is run by IBM makes software and so do third parties. This is what they've done. So I think it's super smart for Arvin and the team to recognize that the open ecosystem is the play. Now, the question I want to see is what's the closed loop on how that data integrates between partners and IBM and IBM and their customers? Because Gen AI is about agents talking to each other in the future. So, so again, that's still an open book. There's time to get there. But Dave, this to me is the most significant takeaway for me is that international business machines, IBM, is kind of going back to its roots, deliver hardcore computing, computer power, technology and professional services integrate with other stuff and work with third-party applications that run on your stuff or, or the hardware. So the middleware layer is fun. Again, this is significant and it's very deep in the weeds, but I think this, if they can pull off this open ecosystem, which is not yet done, okay, clean up their go-to-market, get the word out, they can do this. They are they are on the radar, in my opinion. Well, they should be on everyone's radar, and stock price you know, reflects that. IBM's partner strategy has ebbed and flowed uh, prior to Arbin taking over, and he's been again very clear that he said it was, was really interesting how he framed it. He said, you know, you can look at your competitors that are growing faster than you are, 
and think, you know what, we want a piece of that action. We want to compete with them. Um, and, 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 but you know what, rather than do that, let's identify some of the unique capabilities that we can bring to a partnership. And because it's, as Matt Baker often says, it's not a zero sum game. Uh, remind me to tell you something about Matt Baker too, but it's not a zero sum game. Rather, let's bring unique value to that partnership and it's a win-win. We'll increase the partner's revenue, maybe even help with the growth, growth rate and we'll drive new revenue. They identified seven partnerships in particular, it's like SAP and Salesforce and you know several others. And he said that four out of those sevens are generating more than a billion dollars annually and within short order, they're going to have the other three generating a billion dollars annually. So that's driving $7 billion of business. And so that's just definitely a different mindset. Just a quick aside, Matt Baker, I had tweeted, I was quoting, you know, Arvind doing a live tweeting. And I said, you know, I think, I think he said 24 to 36 months or 18 to 36 months till quantum. And Matt Baker was like, <clears throat> no way. And so that was kind of Kind of interesting. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, he we'll said see that's kind the of conjecture. The yeah. You know, but, I love, I love but nonetheless, I mean, every company IBM's has making, that. IBM is making big bets on quantum. You know, last year in November, when I went down to the Thomas J. Watson Research Center, we got a big dose of quantum. We got the tour. And I hadn't really paid attention to it, but there were like five or six analysts in that audience last year and this year. I don't know if you saw it. You, I'm sure you did. When the quantum presentation went down, these five or six analysts perked up. They were asking all the questions and, you know, I had my hand up. I was like, you know what? I'm going to let these guys ask questions because, you know, you and I got some questions and your question game was on on point, by the way. But, no, thank but you. My, my point is that they, these these are, are really knowledgeable analysts. I talked to a few in the cocktail party and, and you know, I think I think it's time to start paying attention to quantum, whether it's, you know, 12, 24, 18, 36 months away. I do feel like it's coming and it's going to have a big impact on the industry. And I think AI and quantum are going to come together. Not not this year, not next year, but yeah. it's something to keep an eye on. Yeah, and I think I think you're I think you're right on. On your open innovation, you mentioned the partnerships. Um I think they have a hard time on this. I think it's going to be a tough slog. They have to get build that muscle up. They're looking good right now. I like what the deals they've got. And remember, there's a I think we might have brought this on into the podcast, but I'll say it again. The word intentional has been kicked around in the nomenclature. It's becoming more frequently used. Intentional partnerships. And I bring it up, Dave, because with generative AI, intentional relationships matter because there's a trust equation emerging around data sharing. So there's, everyone's going for the data layer right now. If you're in a data layer, whether it's control plane, harmonization layer, whatever you call it, everyone will have to have some sort of control plane or semantic layer for their stuff, but also it has to talk to other people. So what's happening with Gen AI is the highly available and high availability of data has to force intentional relationships that essentially can work end to end and be vetted. What's behind the API? What's behind the Gen AI query or prompt? Data exchanges in real time will be a standard feature in Gen AI period and no doubt in my mind and that's come up. That's not yet to been discussed. So what you're seeing people do is not do the you know, logo farm for partnerships. Look at all the partners we got. They're going small ball. They're playing small ball, to use the baseball metaphor. And it's in the early innings, but if they're playing small ball, because the smaller, more intentional relationships, the more acute the, the fidelity is in the data on how the quality of it. And the trust fact, because you're essentially delegating a relationship. And automation works within that delegation between trust. This is huge. It's, it's, no one talks about it, but it's, it's important. Now, to your quote, I had a screenshot here. The top five GSIs, um, uh, AWS, Microsoft, SAP, Oracle, Salesforce, Adobe, Palo Alto Networks are delivering nearly 50% of the consulting revenue. Okay, Those logos. In the logo farm, they have IB, uh, there's IBM, Adobe, Salesforce, Meta, AWS, Microsoft, SAP, Palo Alto Networks, NVIDIA, Salonis, and ServiceNow. Now, I'm interviewing Salonis, the CEO here, and the Cube will be at their event in Munich next week. So Salonis is on the list, Dave. Okay. Whoa. Yes. IBM and Salonis is partnering. Service now. You see what, where this is going. And this, again, another little nuance out of the IBM meeting is that all the innovations going in on all this plumbing and work, workflows, tickets, um, automation around process improvement. So it's, it's not your yesterday's business process improvement. It's a new kind of thing. It's this is where again I think we're seeing the beginning of the agents 
coming. So free agent movement. I know you have thoughts on this, so go. <laughs> so, so a couple of things. I really like your small ball analogy, and I agree with you. IBM's in the partnership thing. If I'm a, if I'm IBM, I'm going to partner and say, we have a huge install base, and we're gonna we're gonna give you access to that in exchange for we want you to use Watson X. So he said Watson X has gone from you know tens of millions. This is Watson 2.0, tens of millions to you know well over 150 million or hundreds of millions, he said. Um, but so, and that's a that's a good small ball example. I think, you know, they're going after, you know, really logical use cases like contact centers. And we saw some examples of where they're applying yeah. AI. There are other strategies, again, small language models or smaller, large language models. And they're going after cost efficiency. So with through whether it's mixture of experts or just better, better training and better, you know, science, they're able to dramatically lower the cost of model deployment and model training and model usage. So that's a good yeah. small ball example. And then they got a cleanup hitter. They got big poppy in the, you know, <laughs> in the minor leagues right now in quantum. And that's their, that's their big ball game. And so they're being patient, waiting big for poppy. it. Really like that. And now, now, now yeah. the, the point of Salonis was really interesting. So George, George Gilbert turned me on to Snowflake in 2015. He said, pay attention to this company. They're going places. He turned me on to Salonis last year, mid last year. He said, Dave, watch this company. They're doing some really interesting things at the harmonization that the data harmonization layer and the agent control framework. I'm like, what's an agent control framework, George? He explained it to me. That's when we started writing about agents. Now everybody's talking about agents. This is like nine months ago, George was sort of educating me on this stuff. Salonis is a super interesting company that's that's attacking both of those layers. I think UiPath is, has aspirations to do the same. We'll learn more next week. But the, the, the point I want to make here is we heard a lot about um, AI. We heard we heard some about agents and in and, and the future. But you and I poked at this with a couple of customer briefings. Yeah. That data layer is critical. Unless you have that harmonized data, it's it's back to Rob Thomas. You can't have IA or AI without IA, information architecture. You can't have AI without information architecture and good data. And so we didn't hear enough at this meeting yeah. about the data strategy. We did talk to Ritika in the hallway grab, and there's a lot there that really wasn't- Well, no, I, I, I had a deep dive with Bruno Aziza. So Bruno, he's the listener of the pod. Bruno, if you're out there uh, at the gym uh, or uh, creating a podcast out on of a our podcast- field, <laughs> On a soccer field. On a soccer field. Bruno is just- too. I was in that deep Bruno, dive. Bruno, I also did an interview with him. It'll be published a little bit later because IBM kind of did it and it was a little slow with the videos. Um, but um, Bruno just got pulled out of Google Ventures. He's now over there running as group vice president, all the go-to-market and product management for- uh, Ritika. So she's got AI, data, and analytics. Now, Bruno has been on the Cube since 2012. He's been in with us on this big data journey from uh, 2010 when we started, Dave, with Hadoop. And he's seen the many different ways on the analytics side. He has a unique perspective around analytic engines and, and the multi, he used the word multi, multimodal, multi-step. And, and this is he's got a good narrative. He's got a good view on this. Ritika comes from the, the Google Cloud as well. They work together. I'm expecting that to be a big deal because they have clear line of sight on market opportunity on how analytics is changing and the work that has to get done on the big data side inside the, the distributed computing environments. Like they, their experience with BigQuery at Google, they understand how the data engineering or SRE-like role is emerging as well as the application side. So I think that's a group to watch. Bruno, we're, if you're, we're gonna be watching you. So we'll, of course- hey, we'll Don't get, get off that, more. don't get off that yet because it's not clear to me what the data strategy is and what the foundation is, what their version of BigQuery is. I didn't get a chance to talk to Sanjeev Mohan about this or you know, a little bit. Tony Bear was asking the question. He was pushing the question at Arvind. You haven't heard, talked much about Watson X. And he goes, well, that's shame on yeah. them. Watson X is crucial. But I didn't get a chance to talk deeply to Sanjeev, Mo, Sanjeev Mohan about the data strategy. I now maybe I missed it because I had to do a couple. No, of they are, I, they're not telling anyone, Dave. It's a secret, dude. It's a double. It's a, it's a secret. It's a secret sauce. Now I, yeah. <laughs> I went. I no, went. I mean, I, but, but, but hold on, hold on a second, because IBM's history in data is is interesting. Remember, Picciano used to run the whole data uh, business, and it's always been largely bespoke. I mean, they got DB2, they got a couple other data platforms, but it's it's not 
you know, they kind of missed the modern the separation of compute and storage yeah. and the cloud data warehouse because they kind of miss cloud. So they've got to retool that. So I, I need to learn more before I really- Well, be, of, let me tell you what I, I, let me tell you what I know. Cause I, I, this was one of my focus areas going in to, to dig around and, and connect dots. I, IBM is not talking about it, I think for two reasons. One, I think they already know the answer and, but it's not baked yet. I asked uh, that direct question to Arvin, what's your data layer strategy for closed loop? I asked directly in the panel, Share what's your shared data layer? And if you look at IBM and zoom out, here's what's happening. They are nailing the lower end of the stack with the compute and they got Ansible. Ansible and Red Hat, that's kicking ass. They're doing great. Ansible is well down the road on automation and AI is kicking ass because they have all the use cases and they got self-healing. They pretty much got Agentic going in my mind on their little end there. So, but when you move up the stack, IBM is trying to shift from being a data silo provider, whether it's DB2, um, uh, web methods, whatever they got, they got all these different tools. Of course, the Watson's their flagship brand. So here's what's happening. It's not about the data strategy of product. It's how their data strategy will work to create value. And here's what I mean. Arvin said to us, they're not going to compete against other people. They're going to partner and integrate. Okay, so their go-to-market's open ecosystem. Box, AWS, Amazon's behind them. They're selling the marketplace. That's, I think that's working. But how do you make money from a product standpoint? How do you create product differentiation when you have an open ecosystem that's connected with data? Not just the partners, but customers are connecting IBM and the partners, okay? So here's my view. There's only two ways to make money in that business model, okay? You either own the bus, the control plane, or you own the app or both. Can you name one billion dollar valuation company that has a bus control plane uh, product. Maybe Tibco, but that was not really a bus. Um, What's so a, there's, no, yeah. there's no money. I mean, you're talking no about integration. I mean, I think that's increasingly important, but okay, but I, I get your point. I, I think, you I, I think the there's only one, you either own the, own the control bus or network or plane, which what do you want to call it, the connection, I'm moving data around, because you're data brokering, right? So if you're a data broker, you're moving data around, how much, what are you going to really make there? You got to control the application. So there's application and bus, control bus. That's, when data is moving and that's car, core strategy, that's the only way to make money. IBM has to make money on the product side from the open ecosystem in Watson. They got to own the app. They got to own the app and they got to be the catalog of catalogs. They got to have the layer and they okay. got to create value in Watson. If they don't, they don't, they're going to, the go to market open ecosystem is not monetizable. Okay. So, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The application stack, I think you agree, because of AI is reshaping. And the point of control, notwithstanding Oracle, is shifting from the database to the governance layer and the data catalog. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And But a lot of that's becoming open source. And so I think IBM's strategy there is to be a catalog of catalogs and a you know, governor of governance platforms. They're, bro so, they're brokering data, Dave. They're basically well, brokering I data. Between. I, I understand. So that's so that's the, the that comms layer, if you will, that broker layer that you talk about. My point is this: I think just listening to Dario Gill and Rob Thomas, I think they have a very good technical understanding of the future potential of Agentic, and I also think they know it's going to take a long, long time to get there. The question that is not clear to me is how well IBM understands the need to harmonize that data and what capabilities they, they and what capabilities they have to do that because once you are able to if you can own that harmonization layer which is a combination of technology like knowledge graphs and, and other capabilities there then you and you have a, a governance catalog then you can confidently in, in a trustworthy manner serve up yeah. that data to agents and control it, control privacy, you know, govern yeah. it, et cetera. Yeah. And, and then the other, the other piece is to interpret top-down goals from the organization and execute on bottom-up workflows because you've got the back-end connections into SAP and Oracle and Salesforce yeah. and Workday and ServiceNow, which they're building those partnerships. So there's a system, there's an agentic, you know, it, it, agents aren't just, you know, co-pilots floating around. It's, there's a system. Yeah that has to get built. And I think IBM are system thinkers. It's still unclear to me how yeah. they harmonize yeah. that, that data layer. 
I think I think your point is right on. They have to do more work here. It's early, it's not yet needed because the world's not yet there because the infrastructure stuff's being done. But you're right; they got to figure that out. They got to yeah. test it. But it's clear that from what, hearing the CEO Arvin talk, the Watson application will be the, the the gravity of the glue for the clients. Again, remember international business machines. They're compute and AI and services to their customer. What's going to unlock value? Data. So you have to have the application. It has to be somewhere in Watson. They got to own the application. And that application is to create value for their customers, which is brokering agents being that agent system or whatever they do. That has to be the key. And I, I think that's where they have to go. That's no other place. Now, there's other things. as Z, revenue. But if they want to win the AI game and still have this open ecosystem, because look at Salonis. Look at ServiceNow. They're, they have workflows in the enterprise. So if they could provide... A pl an application platform to connect ServiceNow tickets with a company that's benefit Salesforce. Why is Salesforce important? Any enterprise that's using Salesforce now can broker into Watson X and be the center point of that, the tip of the spear, the gravity, the glue, whatever you want to call it. So I think, I think that's where IBM's going. I think it's a smart strategy. I think that's a good strategy. It's non-threatening to anyone it's saying, hey, Hey, Dunn and Bradstreet, I can open up more value for you. you. You're sitting on all this data. That's IBM's old playbook. We'll come in, we'll bring the mainframe, and we'll get you online, and we'll create value with our computing. Here, they're just doing a little bit different. Here, you already got computing. Let's make it better, lower power, faster. But here's the AI computing for you, and here's the services you can unlock yourself to create business value. So business productivity is the 10x opportunity. That's why I like your earlier point about Mohammed, I think the strategy sounds, logic is sound. So but can they execute? <laughs> right? so, well, uh, they, well uh, you yeah. know, the thing about <laughs> IBM, and I was, I remember, I mean, being critical of IBM, I said, look, you, you're really a services company. This is, you know, 10 years ago. I remember Joe Barkin, who was in uh, analyst relations, was like, oh boy, rolling his eyes. I'm like, Joe, it's true. I mean, it, you know, I mean, Gerstner was a services guy, saved IBM. Palmasano yeah, continued that continued that legacy, <clears throat> got rid of the PC business, and it was still services led. And then Ginny who was a services person, continued that at a time in which cloud was completely reshaping the services business. And so, so finally, under Arvind and with Muhammad Ali's leadership, they're rethinking services. And they're, yeah. uh, IBM is basically trying to leapfrog the other services competitors and drive, you know, get there first. Have better yeah. margin. Be be more software, you know, and automation oriented. When you talk to guys like Accenture, I mean, they're a great company. I mean, tremendous firm, especially in you know things like marketing and marketing automation and and and, and you know great industry expertise. But they don't have the software chops that IBM yeah. has. Now, what IBM never did is what Oracle did: is take all that software that Steve Mills and Ambush Goyal bought and fuse it like Oracle Fusion with a better integration strategy. They tried and, you know, they gave some, you know, frankly, sort of, you know, half-hearted efforts over the years, but they never did the hard work that took Oracle 10, 11 years to do. Now, now I think they're starting to do that. AI gives them an opportunity to bring that together. And holy cow, John, we're 50 minutes in and we, all we're talking about is IBM. So obviously- they're, they're <laughs> Well, they're an important company. Yeah. I and mean, look at IBM, I mean, first of all, people throw a lot of shade on IBM. By the way, you weren't wrong about being a services company, but I think what they've done and they made it a feature, not a bug date. And a lot of, and you, and you and I have this conversation all the time, we're services, this is services. There are, it, it used to be two types of people. They love professional services or they hate them. In Silicon Valley, if you're a startup and you say, hey, our strategy is to have a, the best professional services, you'd get kicked to the curb because it's like they want exponential growth. Get the arena, go big or go home. Now in AI, it's a feature, not a bug. So you can have professional services and have a scalable platform. I think you know, to, to kind of wrap up you know, this IBM portion of the pod 50 minutes in, that's what they're doing. So we're going to keep an eye on it. But I will say, you know, people throw a lot of shade on IBM for being old guard and they deserve some of it. But the new team there under Arvin is really doing the right things, in my opinion. They still got to clean up some of the, that, the legacy, whether it's the go-to-market efficiencies, the stuff that Arvin said Arvin says self-inflicted. But just because they don't have a super cloud or a big CapEx doesn't make them bad. Their stock price is doing good. At the end of the day, Dave, it's going to come down to revenue. And again, back to my thoughts, international business machines. That was their original name. You know, so, one other thing. 
before yeah. we get off my BM, <clears throat> I don't know if you caught this. And I don't know if it's NDA, so I'm going to say it in a way that doesn't break an NDA. But IBM has semiconductor chops, even though it, you know, basically, quote unquote, sold. It basically gave its, its it, it it paid Global Foundry, Foundry to take its 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 uh, uh, microelectronics business, and you know, and then Global Foundries couldn't compete on the volume for the for the advanced uh, manufacturing. And so I think I think IBM is suing them or got their money back. I, I don't even know the details there, but. And Floyd and I have written about this. IBM has got really good semiconductor chops, particularly as it relates to low latency. <clears throat> and we saw some stuff around, you know, large SRAM based memories that like what Apple has, like what NVIDIA has. Um, yeah. You know, we, we've, <clears throat> we've talked to Charlie Kawas, <clears throat> excuse me, about like chip, the chiplet architecture. And that's obviously a growing trend. But, you know, I'm a big fan of big memories with synchronous access yeah. to those memories. And I think there's markets for both. My, the reason I bring this up is because it relates to one of the other big news items, which was a AMD and Intel, you know, getting together yeah. And, and, yeah. and basically Intel trying to, you know, breathe more life and elongate x86, which is a managed decline business. And uh, yeah. that was an epic moment seeing... Pat biting his tongue up there with Lisa Sue. Um, Rob Pope has a headline: "Pigs can fly." AMD and Intel. Get together. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, we'll see. Justin Hotard's over there, so we knew him from HPE. Yeah, Dave, it's interesting. I also had a conversation with some of the IBM research people. And again, this is not NDA; it's more industry-wide knowledge or not well known, but I'll, I'll share it. Yeah, really we always talk about developers going to the kernel level. If you look at what's going on right now. You mentioned memory. Back in the 80s, when I was getting my CS degree, there was two things that you had to code by hand on every system, device drivers and then memory management systems. You had to use memory, you had to play with memory because it was limited memory. So you had to write all kinds of memory management software to handle swapping out memory to disk and managing Aging, that as, yeah, a, as, right. as, a, as, a code, as a code base. The same thing is happening now with these AI systems because there's so much opportunity for developers to get competitive advantage by coding to that level, you're starting to see that assembler, that kernel level, that C programmers going down the stack to get this micro coding level value, okay? Not because it's cool, because that's where the money is. Because the money on one revenue you could generate from having a better, faster product, and two, the cost management side of it. So I'm telling you right now, it's not really talked about a lot, but that's gonna be a big deal, again. A lot of stuff. You I mean, brought it up earlier. Happened. Perplexity is the example you always use. I love that example. Yeah, I mean, love these guys perplexity. are just great coders. I love perplexity. the other thing. Again, it, it, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, but, uh, really no, the, what perplexity is doing is a tell sign what's going to happen in the enterprise. Again, all the consumer action is yeah, out there on the AI side. Only one percent of yeah. AI is in enterprise. This is IBM stuff. I kind of believe that stat to be true. It's just people are just kicking tires right now, doing pilots. They're like, how do I scope this thing? What's the cost structure? Where am I going to get the budget? So I think you know we're in the we're in the uh, you know yeah you know, what's the expression teenage sex everyone's doing it but no one's do talk everyone's talking about it, but nobody's doing it um, expression remember that? that's kind of what's going on here right um, oh god yeah I do okay it's, it's, the other thing, you know <laughs> the other thing is did you see the epic post by Paul Gillen this week or today a big dust up why two AI giants are at war over who's more open I'm not sure I would have used no, that title. But so about yeah. six weeks ago, Benoit Dajaville uh, gave us an exclusive where he basically said, you know, you guys are suckers for falling for Databricks um, marketing. And we're like, whoa, OK, yeah. tell us more. Yeah. And so that's, that story, that story hit up. this morning. That story yeah, hit this so, morning, this Friday. Right. And so I was like, wow, this is awesome. Let's, this is good, great content here. Let's publish it. And of course, Rob Hope was like, whoa, whoa hold on. Let's let's get Databricks perspective. So he assigned that to Paul Gillen, who's you know our top top yeah. guy, top journalist. journalist. Yeah, and did yeah. this did the amazing content. piece here. I I, mean, I I wish he used a more more um, you know yeah. catchy title, a more more clickbaity title. Because it's, it's <laughs> worth reading. <laughs> My they, DMs they, are blowing up, so I know it's a good post. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's really good. He talks about the collision yeah. course. He quotes these guys. He's got. Uh, Dave Menninger uh, quoted. Uh, he's got you know Ryan Blue, who we had on Breaking Analysis. Yeah. Benoit lays the gauntlet down. 
We didn't get Ali, yeah. but we got uh, Databricks uh, uh, Conway. Um, got George Gilbert quoted in there. Talked about Polaris. Talked about Unity. Talked about Horizon. Yeah. It's it's really good. So, you know, I think that's I think that I think that kind of journalism does good for the industry because it's not so much we want to create a war between Snowflake and Databricks. It's more of they're both going to be very important companies. I mean, they don't both companies don't lose in this growing market. I think, you know, I, you may have an opinion on Snowflake, but my opinion on Snowflake is they're too big to lose at this point, unless they really screw up. But I think, you know, this little, uh, you know, match of, of throwing mud at each other or saying we got better than you on the open, it's just, it's good to have the conversation so people can get involved. This open source is going to own everything. Open table formats are going to be super important. So, hey, start having the conversation oh, because there's I, I, more important things going on, like the data layer you brought, you asked the question, yes. how are people going to handle the data layer? And well, power agentic. Exactly. And that's why, the, to me, the big question for both Snowflake and Databricks is, can they be the next great software company? Can they be the next Salesforce? Can they be the next service now? Because that's certainly the promise that Snowflake made at its IPO and has been making with Sloopman and Scarpelli, two investors. We are going to be yeah. the next great software company. My words, not theirs, but they certainly implied that. And we know that Ali Goetze and the team at Databricks absolutely wants to be the next great software company. You know, can they be, or, you know, is it, is it, you know, look at Cloudera. We thought Cloudera had the potential to be the next great software company. That didn't happen. Um, but so that's the big question right now is these changes. Well, come uh, in. And, and Gillen, and just, uh, just Gillen talked about that is all of a sudden the market just completely changed. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, to use a hockey analogy, let's freeze over the let's let's use a hockey analogy. Let's freeze over the data, the lake, and play hockey on it, and skate to where the puck is going, Dave. Um, if you look at what's everyone's talking about right now, and what we're researching is what's next after the data lake. And I don't mean that in a way that data lakes going to be irrelevant. I think data lakes are only going to be more important. The problem that people are hitting right now with data lakes is the extensibility of it. How does it scale up to handle more compute, embedded it with devices. All the top Gen AI uh, systems that I see being built have compute built into it. So you're going to have this distributed computing paradigm. So in distributed computing, you can have centralized repos of data. That's fine. And it could be highly intelligent. It has to be highly intelligent. So the number one thing of Snowflake and Databricks is get rid of the distractions that's going on and focus on who's going to be what's the Data Lake 2.0. Right. That to me is the bigger conversation. Um, and that's the more important one. So that's what I'm looking at is what's after the data lake. OK. And that's what most of the content comes out of Databricks event. Uh, I didn't go to Snowflake's event. You were there. But I can tell you that the Databricks AI Summit was clearly playing the long game in their narrative. They're trying to position, hey, beyond the data lake, start thinking about open source coders, open source projects, uh, oh. scale. Um, uh, they didn't talk about agents because that was really on the. On oh, the but hype they will cycle next year. I, I guarantee they'll both be talking about agents next year because that future of the stack is the future data lake, right? It's going to be connecting all those data lakes and data warehouses and data stores together through a harmonized layer, call it the semantic layer if you want, and and serving it up to an agent control framework. That's the future, and that's going to take so probably Dave, five to ten years to evolve. But that's where this business is headed. So we mentioned the, the headline: "Pigs can fly with the Intel AMD cooperating on standard uh, x86 architecture." Let's just move to the the um, other two players, TSMC and ASML. Both had earnings. One they had different results. Okay, and this is a really important discussion because the chips are going to be powering the AI. Nvidia hit an all time. High, I think three and a half trillion dollar market cap this week. I don't know if they're trading it today. I haven't looked at the board behind me. And then the big news in the industry that I think is more categorically relevant in a, in a generational sense is that now you have all the hyperscalers looking at uh, nuclear reactors. Okay. So what that means is you're starting to see the pressure from the industry around the performance needed to power AI. It's spawning a renaissance of nuclear energy. Okay. And so there's a lot of questions there. One is that how fast does it go? And is that good or bad? We don't know. Of course, it's good for AI to get nuclear power, but we want another three mile island, right? You saw Chernobyl. Um, so, so there's a little bit of an interesting discussion there. All the big tech nuclear strategies are in play. Amazon announced uh, this week an investment in the area. So 
So nuclear powered plants and nuclear data center, nuclear clouds. I mean, you can't get any more super cloud than that, Dave, you know, to, to goof on our super cloud uh, narrative. But this is really telling because this means that if power can come online, then the limitations of NVIDIA, for instance, around their power requirements kind of goes away. So, you know, we was doing a lot of hallway conversations this week in the past five events I've been to around, does NVIDIA have a moat? Okay. And you talked about Foundry. Who else is doing Foundry? Okay. Everyone's designing chips. So you have chip development demand, power demand, two huge constraints right now in the industry. Uh, and if NVIDIA, which everyone says draws a lot of power and Blackwell and the future versions people are talking about um, to us off the record is it's going to even be require more power. Yet there's other startups doing chips that require less power. IBM was saying small language models don't draw a lot of power. So we start to get into this. If NVIDIA is the leader, what incentive do they have to go to <laughs> a lower power? Again, all that's out there. React to that. Give me your thoughts because yeah. this is well, a, I mean, you got chips, nuclear, NVIDIA, kind of tying yeah. together that if N NVIDIA can NVIDIA leave, they get more power. If they lose power, they could, they're not, their stock could crash. Go. Everybody <laughs> wants a piece of NVIDIA's ass. No question about it. <laughs> Arvin mentioned that, like not he, he didn't say that, but he said, yeah. you know, not, it's not clear that the leader, he didn't mention NVIDIA, but he's clearly talking about NVIDIA. Not as clear that the leader wants to, you know, focus on reducing, um, you know, going after small language models and, and more efficient um, uh, 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 LLMs, the way you know, supporting L more efficient LLMs, the, the way IBM is. I don't know, I, I'm, look, Moore's law was the defining, you know, algorithm of the last, you know, 25 years. And we'll see if Jensen's law is the new algo, which is you basically buy more, you'll save more. And I think it is. Yeah, for, I mean, NVIDIA is only, only thing that could hurt NVIDIA in my mind is that if they don't get the software out there embedded and nested into the environment, both data centers on the consumer side, clouds on the consumer side and enterprise, then what they risk is, Moore's law like dynamic making the power for price performance faster, cheaper, okay, faster. If that happens on an accelerated basis with AMD, for instance, we, we're going to talk to TensorFlow this week on the queue here in NYSE. They're doing a deal with AMD around GPU clouds. Core We was supposed to come on. Ken Goldberg is now VP of engineering over there. Um, she's a great leader. She knows how to run engineering. So maybe get the CTO on. You got Core We. So you have all of these other potential providers, Dave. But so who, who whoever comes out with a better chip right, might but win so, it all. So so just and some much pressure just, on Nvidia. Just some some floyer math. If you look at you know Moore's law doubling performance every two years roughly, and we've talked about this in the cube pod, but I'll just share it again. You know, in today's world, if you so that's about forty percent a year performance improvement in today's world. If you combine the CPU, the GPU, the NPU, the accelerators, all the XPUs, you're talking about well over 100% annually. If you look at what NVIDIA has accomplished in eight years, a thousand percent performance improvement versus x86 in 10 years, which was 100x, 100x was amazing. It was driving yeah. industry innovation, um, but, but a thousand x in eight years, and it's going to continue. So my bet would be if you get out your log log graph paper and draw the line, I think NVIDIA is going to lead. I think it's ARM based architecture gives it the low cost advantage for those high end chips because ARM has the wafer volumes. And I think it's to your point about software, it's it's got the software advantage. I think I shared with you earlier, CubePod, I was talking to a guy who 15 years ago was writing device drivers for, <laughs> for CUDA. He was like, this is like the people that thought I was crazy. It was the most boring job in the world. And now look at how it's paid off. So yeah. I feel very strongly that NVIDIA has a moat. Their demand is way, way greater than the supply. And unless this AI thing is a bunch of BS, I think they're going to continue that. And not to, not to say there won't be opportunities for you know smaller language models, smaller chips. But you know yeah. when Jensen says the world needs bigger chips, I think he's right for a long, long time. The, 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 the yeah. challenge is going to be, because they, they use a big SRAM, it's a big shared SRAM, and it's getting harder and harder to find real estate on that shared S, uh, on that, those, th those chips because of those big memories. And so you can only take 
SRAM so far. So what's going to happen is you're going to have to figure out ways to synchronously yeah. connect across those chips. And, you know, they're pretty good at networking and, and V-links. Yeah. And so that's how they, I think they're going to scale. You know, we'll see how this all plays out. But I feel though, like they're, ahead, they're so far ahead of the market that they're going to do Ethernet. They're going to do, you know, smaller chips if they have to. They're going to do inference. I think I think NVIDIA can, I think Jensen can see it around corners better than most. Yeah. I think they are going to lead for the next, you know, eight to 10 years. Uh, I, I I'm a little bit more bearish on NVIDIA only because I think they're hyped up right now. I want to see more meat come on, uh, on, on, on the grill here. I want to see some meat on the grill on the new stuff. The good stuff now, they, they're running the table now, no doubt about it. But Dave. How could you not be more excited about enterprise and emerging tech right now? You got nuclear reactors on the big hypers, got nuclear energy coming to the table with the cloud guys. You got Databricks and Snowflake really kind of going next level, a little bit of a, it's like it's like the two cars rubbing each other at the top of the race. They bang, they bang off, who's gonna, hopefully they don't bang off the wall, but they're, gonna, they're, they're rubbing each other, they're, you know, they're getting at it. The market in data unlocking value with Gen AI is clear. IBM showed that and IBM's on top of this, as is everybody else the data unlock new net value will come out of people with large sets of data like Moody's, like Dun & Bradstreet, like Salesforce. People who have data will win if they don't screw it up. And then all the action going down to the semis. You got reInvent coming up. You got KubeCon, supercomputing, all the events we're going to be at. I mean, and startup funding, looking at the list right here. I mean, we're going to talk to 70 startups here next week. OK, um, just a lot of a lot of you can start to start to see the formation. People are reorganizing. Platforms are being rebuilt. I mean, you couldn't be in a more exciting time, Dave, in, in enterprise. All all the theaters, all the areas are popping with innovation and disruptive innovation. So it's like it's causing some action uh, in, in all the areas. So that means startups, will, I think, will come out of the woodwork uh, and take some territory. And we're going to try to help them with the, with the cube, getting the word out here and Silicon Valley in Boston. And the big guys are playing. So, well, it's a historic people like moment. The, people don't like the term super cycle. I actually love the term because I think we are in a super I cycle. And I think I it's going to continue term. for the better part of a decade. Um, yeah. I do. Super cycle, super apps, super studio, super, super cloud, cloud. <laughs> super cool. And I got to go. We're in. <laughs> All right. Hey, good, Dave, luck good, good luck today. Good luck today. Awesome I mean, seeing you this week. Crush it at NYSE. Can't wait to be down there again. All right. Well, good luck with your two interviews today. And then again, if you're listening next week, if you're in New York City, send me a DM. Uh, we've got an events going on, evening activities. And of course, go to siliconangle.com. Again, the Gillen post about Snowflake, Paul Gillen, great story. Thanks for watching. See you next time.